nutshell, this is my so-called handmade life. I have a blog by the same name, and that's my name on Instagram. On Ravelry, I am Mamatronic. Look me up, friend me, talk to me. I will respond as much as I possibly can. This is a knitting, crochet, handmaking, whatever I feels like talking about kind of podcast, and I ask questions of you. And when you respond in the comments, I respond back in the next episode, and hopefully we keep a back and forth going. It only really works, though, if I get comments. Otherwise, I can just talk to myself, but I prefer it if we are kind of guiding a conversation together. So, I have had this sweater that I'm wearing, the Guilloche Pullover by Albina McLaughlin. I've had this finished for a while, but I wanted it to have its own episode because I'm going to kind of rave about Albina's patterns and her, uh, I don't know, online presence. And I just wanted to show it to you. Plus, it's actually cool, and I don't need AC to wear this. So, this is the guilloche pullover. I'm going to stand up and kind of show you some details. I probably have an end not tucked in. You see the split hem. There's a good deal of ribbing, which I always really love at the bottom of the sweater. A lot of ribbing on the sleeve. So these sleeves are actually made. A lot of people, here we go. There we go. You knew I didn't have those ends tucked in. So a lot of people make this sweater so that it will have a fold over cuff. So this works, this fits. This fits like a store bought sweater would on me. I typically like more cuff like this, and then I can even do this and have a bit of a, a kind of a poof where the ribbing ends like this. And I actually like this fit right here. It's so easy to cover my hands if I'm cold. I love this depth of ribbing. You can really do that any way you want, but there's this all over honeycomb pattern and I love it. You can see here, it's my very favorite type of sweater, is a raglan. I just feel like easiest, best fit for a sweater, very casual. Um, and I usually can make it, I usually make them where I have a little bit of room, which is the case here. I have a little ease so that I can layer over things. I love this. I love the neckline with this thick fold over. Um, neck and there's neckline shaping. So it's not just a straight crew. It's got a nice little shaping to the neckline. It's just all over, just all around a great pattern. I've probably started this shortly after I moved here and I worked the body pretty quick. I did a nice big swatch and I trusted Albina's pattern because without blocking that swatch looked way too small. But as I worked on the body and got further and further, it just sort of shrunk like a tube sock, <laughs> like a ribbed sock. It just kind of cinched in and I felt more and more insecure about the sizing of it. I also set it aside just because it, I had to look down to knit the cables. And I went through a period where I was doing a lot of stuff and I was only knitting if like, I don't know, sitting and waiting for something or when my husband and I were watching something and it was dark in the room. I wanted something I didn't have to look at. So I finished the body, I started on a sleeve, got through another sleeve partly, and then just left it. And this is one of the makes I finished with Sleeve Timber with the Laura and Allison Party Network. Um, I went ahead and added one more repeat of the body. As you can see, it's pretty, it does not have to be this long. Like the top of my pants, well, the top of my pants comes right about here. So maybe it did for me, but I do have a long torso. And you know, as I see other people talking about the length of their arms, I really do have an, at least one extra inch to the average woman, I think. Um, so I added length in both sleeves and body. And then I attached and started working up. And it was just really easy. I had, I think I told you, one of the benefits of taking, like, um, of doing, like, group knit stuff, uh, uh, Allison had suggested 
I should block the body just to make sure since it looks so cinched in and small, just to make sure it fit before finishing sleeves and then, you know, hating life when none of it worked. So I did that and uh, I'll put in images here of it blocking. It was fine. It just whoop, spread right out. It didn't require any pulling or pinning. I mean, my cat laid on it, but that was about it. Just perfect. It's, it's easy to trust this pattern. You can trust Albina's patterns and she puts a lot of thought um, and tech editing into her patterns. So what do you think? I love this. I love this design. It's pretty classic. I remember uh, several years ago, uh, there were a lot of store-bought honeycomb type stitch uh, designs similar to this uh, in stores. And mm, I think maybe my daughter bought one, at, like an Old Navy. It wasn't high quality yarn. It wasn't a high quality sweater. And I wore it a bit, but I outgrew it. And I don't know, it did not, provide the satisfaction. The ribbing, not as quality. The neckline, no way. It was super stretched out. It didn't have nice a nice fit on it. Or, and I guess it was kind of thin, kind of flimsy, lighter weight, but nothing pleases me more than having made my own version so much better of this in one of my favorite colors. This is Wool of the Andes. I think it's Lost Lake Heather. Wool of the Andes Tweed which is one of my favorite yarns to use for sweaters. And I love a good green, and this has a nice, a nice, uh, I don't know, mottled color with the heathering in here and the little nubs of tweed. This is my second pattern though from Albina. I will flash a picture of, uh, I still haven't done a blog post on Fisherman's Muse, that was, the first sweater pattern I knit from Albina, but the fit is perfect. It was contingu contiguous sleeves, which I, I had never done before. And I got the fit. I, I wanted just a little ease, maybe more than most people who knit the pattern would call for. Uh, it was just perfect. And I did that in Newted and Yarn, and I'm so pleased with how that looks. Albina, knits a lot of her patterns in Newtoden, or sometimes she'll have multiple versions, and she often will include a Newtoden specific sample, and sometimes instructions in the pattern that are specific to Newtoden, because it's sort of, it's like a, a, a plutolope, unspun, probably about a lace or fingering weight, held just one strand and then you can, I'd use three strands to knit the Fisherman's Muse, which should have been about an Aran weight sweater. So I love that, that a yarn that I am interested in and have a bit stockpiled, she's got this plethora of patterns that will work. I know it will work with them because I can see the samples. But another thing I like about it is that I do one of my few Patreon accounts that I am part of is Carolyn Hinkelius's Honer Oker, and she produces the Newtoden yarn. For Newtoden um, subscribers or subscribers to that Patreon, which is very affordable, it's just like a flat, cheap uh, Patreon fee of like five dollars. Albina will often have a coupon code and it's a very steep discount of her patterns. So I actually have quite a few of her patterns that I want to knit and was purchased that way with a great discount. Often also when they're new, there is a discount on Ravelry, but the Newtoden subscribers get a little bit of a, a little bit more of a discount. So, uh, I took some photos of this, I tried to, walking outside and it was kind of a cool day um, in the woods with my husband, but it was also yucky and muddy and I don't know. I don't know how any of them will come out. I took those weeks ago, but I've just been, you know, I told you in the last episode, I've just been, had a lot of new things happening, of family events stuff kind of all converging onto this end of the year. And I was kind of stressing and struggling to find time to do like creative pursuits. So I have put off a little bit of that. I've just said, 
I can only take this many chunks of things until like maybe after my son's graduation, maybe. <laughs> I don't know, Christmas is coming, but then life is gonna settle down a little and I'll be able to do more. I'll be able to finish that exam prep and then uh, also just some of my creative pursuits, you know. there It's like hobby stuff, right? Um, so we'll see when I get this post up. I want to do this and Fisherman's Muse really close together. Go ahead and talk about them on my blog. That is where I have all the details of what I did with these um, designs. Everything from you know the needle size I used to the yarn colorways. All of those details are there. And I started this so long ago that it's not really fresh in my mind um, what, you know, how I did certain things. I do remember this. In the instructions, Albina has a, uh, a method for doing these cables without a cable needle. Um, she includes instructions for that, possibly even a link to a tutorial with that. But I have found, like I have done cable needle-less cables, but I, it kind of, they kind of look wonky. Now, it, with blocking, like sections of this, I did that. Sections, I did my own personal jank method, which works for me when it's just like a couple of stitches that you're holding. If it's just like one or two stitches, I literally just pull them forward or back between two fingers and hold them while I knit and then slip them back on. I find that's faster than anything else. And uh, it, it seems to work better with my tension. It actually looks smoother even pre-blocking. So, I don't know. That's just something I've done forever. And uh, I just find myself going back to it. But with this, I intended to do cable needle-less cables, but I, I just forgot somewhere along the way and I started doing it my old way. And I, I was like, you know what? I like this, this works better. I like to challenge myself to try new things like continental knitting or something, but then sometimes you just wanna do what feels right and helps you finish the thing. So let me show you a few of Albina's designs that I love. I really like every single one. I've talked about her before. She used to have a very cycling specific blog in the early 2000s called uh, Lovely Bicycle. And she kind of was an inspiration to a lot of people who wanted to commute without a car. She also had like info on all sorts of vintage bikes and how to like, uh, I don't know, spruce them up, make them work for you, different things you could do to make it uh, um, work better with your body, ergonomics, things like that. So she inspired me with a a couple of bikes that I got and tuned up, got some new parts for, and I did all the work myself and I felt really proud of it. And I don't think I would have done it without her inspiration. She's very can-do. And her knitting patterns read that way too. It's very much about uh, uh, exploration and, um, I don't know, modifying. So here's a few that I love. Here's the cutting edge vest. This is a brand new one and you will see one I think is a Newton specific sample but the center one has a slight polo or sailor collar. It's a v-neck vest. I love it. You know I like vests. You know I've already made one too and I really enjoy and I'm, I'm making a third one. The one I'm repurposing yarn for. I really like that little vintage slight uh, shawl collar or sailor collar v-neck. That is her cutting edge. And this pattern employs steaks, so I think it will be a good one for me to learn to steak on because I've never used steaks before. Then we have the harvest season blouse. I think there's a hat and even socks that have the same stitch pattern. This seems to have a bit of a, like a Henley and a dolman shape to it. I think it's meant to have some positive ease. I really like the fit of this. And you can see the her photos. I really enjoy them. They've definitely got a mood to them. This pattern is a new to them. This 
this uh, sample was, I believe, knit and neutered in. So it's kind of cool for me if I wanted to use some that I have. I think I might have enough for this sweater. It gives me an idea of how it will look. When you're using unspun yarn, you might think, well, I don't know if I'll have the right stitch definition or whatever, but right here, that seems to not be a problem. Jadvika, there are two versions, but this is the two color version. It's just a color work yoke sweater, but I do enjoy it. I like it. This very, very colorful version looks fun. I like the fit of this one. This is, Co I think Cosmoc would be how you would pronounce it. The fit looks very vintage to me. It has a bit of an 80s look in the style of it. Or even further back in time, but it makes me think of sweaters in the 80s. Everything's gonna be linked here. Everything is gonna be linked. Um, I hadn't seen so many of those striped when she came out with Song and Dance. I've seen quite a few more that took the color work beyond the yoke, but this is very fun. And this to me says Stash Buster drop, which has that drop sleeve with a slight, like almost teardrop shape to it. I think that's how you would say it. I really like this. There's marled yarns in it. I think this is a pretty right now shape of sweater. It's very classic, um, simple. This one I'm gonna show looks almost slightly cropped. That is the size I would want. I actually wouldn't add to the torso of this, which I normally do, but I wouldn't for this vest because I would want it to have a similar shape. And the last vest I made was long and had a lot of ease. There is a crew neck and a turtleneck version of this. And I think this might be one where her inspiration for the turtleneck possibly came from one of her knitters who, who did that or her, um, maybe her model. That's true of one of her patterns. I don't know which, but that's the turtleneck version. This is a very classic shaped sweater. And here we have the crew neck. Do you like the mood of her photos? She also has a sock pattern. It's the basic sock with an integrated heel. I have knit the, I think it's the Flegel heel, and I talked to you about it in my socks in a rant uh, episode. I believe this is similar, but I'm not sure. I have to get into it and look, but I'll just show you a picture of her basic sock with the integrated heel. It's one where you don't have to knit the front back and forth, back and forth for a heel flap and gusset. And last but not least, this one's a little edgier, a little, to me, more of a fun knit. It's her flippant sweater, which is meant to be one that you could uh, flip upside down and put on either way. The uh, waist, cinched waist, like gathered waist and the cowl neck are similar and so you can wear it from either way and with the shaping of the sleeves you can see yeah I just love it I can't say enough good things about it I don't know what my next project from Albina will be one of these probably the Gan vest or maybe cutting edge vest I appreciate your thoughts on boundaries that you shared it's nice to know I'm not the only person, you know, who's, uh, um, who's dealing with this. And other people affirm it does get easier over time, which I have found to be true. I just mentioned that in my last episode, that some good things had happened regarding that and me feeling a little more capable. You know, every few years, I feel like I bump up my skill a little bit more in maintaining those. I don't know if I mentioned it in the last episode, but Lori mentioned the book Boundaries by Townsend and Cloud, and it's a really good book. It is a Christian, um, it's from a Christian perspective, but if you aren't a Christian, you would still like the book. And I think I've heard that a lot of counselors and therapists recommend it to their clients for just the sound 
principles of where's your space, where's my space? What am I supposed to be concerned about? What is not my under my control? But the uh, attitude, like from a Christian perspective, I think is super helpful for people who are Christians or came from that background and they have a lot of unhealthy, unnecessary guilt that they might carry because you know, you're always supposed to turn the other cheek, you know, why don't you go the extra mile? That kind of stuff, you know, like scripture that kind of gets twisted to where we're supposed to do whatever anybody wants whenever. I like that they have, it, it's not a ton in there, but it's enough so that if that's your issue, like if you've been trained since you were young, that you're, Jesus was a doormat and you should be too. Um, they have quite a bit in there to address that. So it would like help you if that's like what you're, the perspective you're coming from. I just thought I would mention it because Lori did in the comments and I was like, oh yeah, that's a good book. And you know, it's that time of year where everyone's getting around their family and the old boundaries book might need to be pulled out and flipped through. I'll look for my little high, highlighted uh, passages just to see, you know, like a self check. How am I doing? Okay, yeah, still got it. So um, I appreciate all of your well wishes too with that exam prep that I've been doing. So I told you I was working on three sweaters with the Laura and Allison Party Network. Two were classes, and I think I covered why. Even if you've been knitting a long time, a class can be super useful. Well, I just see more and more each week why that's true. Allison has lots of good worksheets that honestly, for like Illuminate as a yoke sweater, I could apply that to any yoke pattern I go to uh, kind of change maybe the, the size, the weight of yarn, the gauge or just, um, I don't know, whatever I might wanna change about it. It really could be applied to so many things. So it's kind of a, a valuable resource, not just one pattern specific. And there's a lot of really interesting links that she's given with helpful tools that you know any knitter could use when you wanna modify. The attitude of do whatever you want, bend a pattern to whatever you want it to look like and be like is pretty freeing. A lot of people are making neat choices. I'm not doing anything too out of the ordinary. I've changed the gauge, you know, to fit the stitch. I've changed the pattern to fit my particular gauge because I am not using sport weight yarn and I, uh, for Illuminate that is. I don't have a lot that I want to change about it, but what I showed you is not what I'm actually doing. All of the yarns I showed you last time, I am using Accept. I worked up, uh, I started working, like you saw the tiniest bit of a neckline with that really pretty sun-soaked yarns and it was a kind of a mocha brown, maybe slightly like a, a grayish brown, similar to this, but it was lace weight mohair. It was too similar to this. Like it, there was, you couldn't even tell this was a color work yoke until you were right up on me. And I just don't want that. This is just too much work to have uh, all this mohair doubled up strands and multiple colors instead of just one main color. I'm using three different fingering weight yarns. This is too much work to have a color work sweater that you cannot tell is color work unless you are breathing down my neck. So I changed to the Rowan Kid Silk Haze in Pearl. This is one of my first fancy yarn purchases way back. <laughs> I think I got it at Hill Country Weavers the first time I went, maybe the second time. So I'm gonna put in a picture of this yoke spread out. I spread it out and I did a steam block just to make sure my gauge remained what I thought it would be, you know, as compared to the little swatch that I did. But look how pretty. I have gone through three colors in the main color. It does have a bit of a gradient look. They blend so well. I don't have the other two with me because I'm not currently using 
the other two fingering weight yarns, but you can see I have one here. I think I switched to another here and I've just about here switched to this one, which I believe is Yu Hughes. I think she's Beaumont Yarn Company now. And I just love this color. So I'm really pleased with how it's working. And I think this is gonna be the softest sweater. I know I will get this done to wear this winter season. My other sweater class sweater, I haven't made so much progress on. You know, it is a swatchless uh, class. And to do it, we're using, we're just, our sleeve is our swatch. And as I work on it, I got pretty far into the sleeve and I realized I was not doing my twisted rib right on the wrong side. I wasn't twisting the purl stitches. I don't know why I did that. I even read through, and I've done twisted rib before, but you know, actually I do know why I did it because this is what I do. I take something easy and I make it extra hard by not focusing. Do you hear my dog snoring? <laughs> She's like, you are such a bore. Uh, but here is where I am. This is Cascade 220. It's the turtle colorway. I've had this stash for a while. So I, I have re-knit and I am behind even in watching. I've watched two or three of the classes. I have one more that I need to watch, but I, I have the classes, like I am not taking it live and I knew I was going to be behind. So I just wanted the classes to, I don't know. I mean, the idea of Ondawa with no swatches, I just couldn't pass that up. So there is an option to do classes, just re watch the recordings and not be live in the class, but it is more fun to be live in the class. I'm live in Illuminate. Okay. So that's my progress here, not much, and also hard to do with uh, all the charting, <laughs> unless I'm actually setting aside time to knit and only knit, which I haven't done a lot of. Okay, the last thing I'm doing, not as a class, but it is a knit along, and Laura McDougall is talking about so many aspects of the sweater how you choose your sleeve length since it's a bottom up. It's the Lilana, maybe Lilana. And I have knit one sleeve and I'm about to hear on my other sleeve and just deciding where to stop. You know, the knit along has been helpful with me for that. Now, some people chose to start with sleeves. Some chose to start with the bottom of the body and work up, then make their sleeves and then attach and it will be a raglan similar to this. But I wanted to do sleeves because that's the part I hate the most. I wanted to get them over with. Let's see. And here's where I am. So you can imagine how the body is really gonna go because doing this kind of color work, stranded stuff, we are constantly turning, constantly turning on a small sleeve is not as much fun as when you've got like a big meaty body to work on and you're not turning quite so much. The yarn isn't getting as tangled. Um, I do knit with two hands like for color work, but it's not that big of a deal. Like you could just use one hand and kind of drop yarn and pick it up because this is just every few stitches. It's a very clear dot pattern. And this was that yarn I showed you that fell on me, thus making it clear that it was meant to be. It is Valley Yarns Northampton in Ocean Heather, and I think Light Gray is it's just a very plain name for the gray, but they're both Valley Yarns. I had them set aside for something ages ago that I never did make, and it feels really good to use stash. I've been doing a lot of that. The Illuminate, the Ondawa, and the Lilana all stash. I am better than you. So that is my Lilana, the sweater I never intended to knit, but I think I needed to. I have not cast on Christmas socks. I told you I wanted to make selfish Christmas socks. I haven't done that yet, but I did finish my 
Olivia Villarol, who is This Handmade Life, her Sweet Woodruff pattern. I don't know if I told you a while back, I didn't know what Sweet Woodruff was referring to. It's a, like an herb or a weed. But isn't this a sweet? This makes me think of that color that I thought was the color of 2023. This little bit of purple in here, this lavender. But this is overall a gray yarn from Miss Mothballs. And so I did do a longer cuff so that it could fold over, which is fun. It looks cute in clogs if your cuff is going to show or it's just extra warm. Either way, this is really fun. Great pattern. I did a rounded toe. And let's see. One thing, okay, so I did those and then I have pumpkin spice latte from Mustache Yarns. I have some yarn, actually I'm wearing this right now. I don't know if I wanna be one of those people who holds their foot up and says, look, this is actually not my leg, it's someone else's. It's a really great fall, Thanksgiving vibe type colorway. I am going to do a blog post on those, but I do think I talked about them ages ago, maybe before I moved in this podcast. So I had a little ball this size of each one. Her mustache must match sock sets. Each come with a little cake. They're exactly alike. So whether you choose to knit from the inside or the outside of the cake, you will get the same thing on each sock, as long as you choose to knit from the outside on both or the inside on both. This was how much I had left for each one, pretty much. So I've made, I'm working on one right now. I just cast on a second one. I felt like I had enough to do shorties and I almost did. I ran a bit short and I just sort of did a mishmash whatever pattern with it. I mean, I guess I could say, yeah, it's not smooth operator because I did a heel flap and gusset. I just did my own thing. And I, it looks so, um, it looks kind of hodgepodge with all the color, the way the heel flap, I didn't add for the heel flap. That's just the way the colorway worked. And I tried to get that look. Um, you know, it starts with a, it looks like a tiny um, top of elastic or something here with one colorway and then it moves into the others. And then I got to the center, the arch of the um, sock and I just started knitting ribbing because I thought, well, it won't hurt anything. That part doesn't really touch, you know, my, the bottom of my, the sole of the, the foot and it won't create too much uh, volume of fabric. And then I thought it really looks a lot like the little sport socks that have that ribbing to kind of draw it in, but this does not work that way. I think I would have to do slip stitch ribbing for that to happen and I didn't do that. This is just some weird kind of Franken sock thing. But right when I got to the end, I ran short of yarn. So I used a little bit of leftovers from my Regia Perfect uh, socks that, I don't know, I showed you a long time ago. They were this color of kind of almost a maroonish brown but I thought it worked fine. You really can't tell it's not part of the sock. And now I have some little short socks. So I'm starting the second pair. The only problem I wanted these to work on in like dark theaters, it's really, you can't do much with it because you're through this little bit of a cuff so fast and the next thing you know, you're onto a heel flap. I can't do that in a theater. I'm not that talented and I sure can't do gusset stitches, so. I was looking for something else I could do in a theater. Oh, I also, on this toe here, I was looking for a, like a traditional rounded toe. This is where you have even decreases the whole way around. And with Smooth Operator, your decreases are on the ends of the needles, like just um, if you're magic looping. So if you have two needles, the ends of each one. And at the very end, you know, you draw it together like a, maybe a hat, a beanie or something. 
if I'm, if I'm right here, I could totally be ugh, blanking. I am pre-menopausal, okay? Um, I just divided this into four sections and did even decreases like you would on the crown of a hat. I think I knit the foot a little bit higher than I normally would because I believe this type of rounded toe is like maybe a quarter of an inch uh, shorter. It makes a shorter toe than if you were to do a Kitchener or a no Kitchener sort of rounded toe. So it fits, it's fine. I went back looking at another Olivia Villarreal sock that I made to find those instructions for a rounded toe and I could swear I did not add this but I think she went back and altered her pattern maybe she didn't like the look of it but this is to me one of those rounded toes and wildflower and honeycomb look at this I have this on <laughs> all wonky here you go this is one of my first sock pairs of socks to knit and this is really held up this yarn held up great this is me mi fo, uh, mi fo, I don't know how to say it. Mi fo, mi fo, it's French. It's red sock, blue sock. And I'm going to cut me trying to say it because it sounds like I'm cussing. Anyway, really pretty, huh? I just wanted to show those because I had them out to look at how I did the toe. Jen made a comment about uh, yeah, I want to do an ask me anything and I want to see your yarn, your uh, sock drawer. My sock drawer is gross, Jen. <laughs> uh, I'm going to do it though. You're going to get a tell all account of my sock drawer, but it's just a jumbled mess. It, it really is. I tend to just wear whatever's on top and it's just like everything's thrown in. It's also mostly not my hand knit socks because it's not cold enough to wear them very often. And I don't know, Jen, you do a lot of hiking, running, and walking. Do you wear your hand knits for that? Or do you go ahead and use like super duper strength uh, sports wool blend socks or smart wool socks? I would be interested. Let me know if you see this, Jen. Um, I'm interested in if any of you wear your, you know, your super sweet, special handmade socks to get the abrasion of super long walks. And I think Jen does super long ones. Like I usually, I like to go on a good two hour walk. But if you do that often, once in a while, my husband and I will do a, a whole day or a half day walk. I just feel like I'll destroy these. I, they're just too precious to me. And so I have quite a few. And I also then have a ton of those mega thick hiking socks that you get at a store. I haven't cast on my Mary Kitchmas socks, which I showed you last week. I haven't cast them on yet. I haven't started any selfish Christmas knitting. You know, I'm gonna do a hashtag and you can casually join me if you want. Selfish Christmas knit. It feels really wrong, you know, for my, my Christian upbringing. 2023, my so-called handmade life is selfish for Christmas. Sorry. But I was talking about using Ravelry's D-Stash to get old discontinued yarns, and I found some of that Herbsblatt Regina oak sock base in somebody's stash that they were willing to sell. So one of these is her Hazel Soft Sock, which is very, I think, I haven't ever knit with it, but I think it will be similar to this, except it's an 80-20 blend of um, merino and nylon, and this is 75-25. And this is the oak. So, just peachy. And speckled eggs, which is a sweet colorway. And these are so special, and then little Regina's little little handmade oh, labels makes me sad and then she threw in some um, lichen and lace that I guess could be a contrast toe heel or toe which was super sweet and not necessary at all but I do appreciate that and I think it would look really cute with either but probably just peachy 
D-Stash, you guys. It works so well on Ravelry. And it's at a better price than if I were buying it new and buying it from overseas. So here's the reason I haven't started all of my selfish knitting. I have been doing gift knitting. <laughs> so I told you I made one baby blanket and then like a bunch of people I know started having babies. And so a one young woman, I didn't even know, like I didn't realize she was pregnant until that baby was almost due. And so I was like, oh, I wanna make something for you. I just didn't realize how little time I would have to do it. So what I did was I, instead of doing like a blanket or clothes or something, I took some leftover cotton yarn I had from a baby gift I made a few years ago to another knitter. And I made, they're basically dishcloth patterns, but I made them with soft cotton as a baby washcloth and gave some baby shampoo and soap with it. So I used like some of these colors. And I'm gonna flash here what I, the patterns I made, but one was the Some Pig, um, washcloth, which was really cute. And I did it in pinks and I'm going to show you the photo of what I did. And then, uh, a cat dishcloth, which, you know, I did in blue and white. And that was Allison de Kaisen. And I knit that before both of those I knit before for a gift. And then Zandy Peters sunshine. Uh, it's like sunshine washcloth or dishcloth and I also made that before really I did four the first time I did this as a baby gift but this time I just didn't have the time because more people are having babies and the next thing I want to do is I have more time for this one um, is this rainbow blanket by burgundy and blush so it's a little retro style to me it looks retro style crochet blanket here's how it's sized to fit like say on a crib that's over the side of a crib i think that's a nice size blanket that's the size i typically go for when i make a baby blanket so that it can be yes a baby blanket but also then a toddler blanket and as you get older a lap blanket what I chose to use because the last baby blanket I knit was in color theory and I wasn't sure, like I knew it would be soft, but I wasn't sure about durability, but that couple say that's, that's their favorite blanket. They use it all the time. I see them use it. It's so sweet. So I chose color theory to do this blanket. <laughs> Lion Brand was having a sale, but also the color palette was perfect for a retro rainbow. So. My background is this cream color. And then let me show you my rainbow colors. With that cream background, I think this will make a really great rainbow. These colors are not primary and I love that. They're a little off and I just think it's gonna be really cool. So I have that. And then later on, <laughs> as I have the time, I want to do the more the merrier blanket. There's two I'm considering, but the more the merrier looks like the most no brainer. You just knit the same stitch over and over and you let striping yarn do the work for you. So this is a like full size bed blanket. I wouldn't do that size obviously for a baby blanket, but the yarn that I have for it is this mandala by lion brand and i think the colorway is sasquatch weird right that's kind of weird because nothing says sasquatch like a rainbow but i do think this will be sweet colors works for any gender works for probably any room palette because they're not so bright i don't think they'll clash terribly with like, if there's baby decor in a room that's all one color or something. So I'm excited about doing that. That one seems like it will be sort of like a granny stripe blanket as far as mindless crochet. Like it might actually be therapy for me. 
not just a gift for the mom. That was also a really mega sized roll of mandala or mandala lion brand yarn that was on their major it wasn't black friday but it was some major something sale they had they're always having a sale you just should never buy from lion brand without 30 percent off at least because if you just wait it, it's coming so i said i was looking for a good uh theater knit and i thought those socks would be it but they just weren't i mean like i was done with the I was ready for the heel flap like as soon as the movie started basically um we went to see the menu i mean it's okay i we saw triangle of sadness which to me was a better like themed and quality movie but like if you've seen it goes kind of far with some stuff um and I think they were gonna have a similar message, but I feel like it was not cheesy Hollywood. I really feel like they delivered the message that all oh, mankind is horrible. <laughs> um, no matter what your advantages in life are, like given the opportunity, we can be pretty terrible. It was kind of dismal, but it was still interesting. And I mean, it was so gross at one point, it was funny. Like everyone was gag laughing in the theater around me. I went to the Alamo, um, oh, is it Alamo Brewery Theater in Austin? It's fun. It's like an old fashioned theater. You're sitting really close to people in old fashioned seats, but they've got like a lot of food and it's just kind of got a fun vibe. They have a lot of older classic movies too. What I had and I thought initially, okay, I will make a, a simple beanie out of this and I will bring it next time I go to the movies. Let me grab it. This is just Patton's Classic Wool Natural Mix. I've had this like out floating around the yarn with, you know, like all the stacks of what I wanna make and, you know, works in progress because it is left over from when I extended the sleeves of my capsule. Remember, I was gonna do a lot of finishing of old patterns, work on them, you know, fix things that need to be fixed and weave in ends. And that was part of what I did. It was about a year ago, maybe a little more. And I, this has been laying around because I only used a little bit of it. And I thought this would be good for a beanie. But then I thought about a pattern that I've seen have you seen Brian Smith's designs? He has so many shawl patterns. I mean, a ton. And sometimes some like shrugs or sweaters on Ravelry. It's kind of prolific. And I saw this a long time ago. It's called Cascade Mobius. And he uses, he uses two Cascade yarns. And the thing I like about his patterns is that he sometimes uses the Cascade yarns that you think how could I make this work in a sweater or in a accessory? Because it might be like hand paints that are kind of so vibrant or um, printed yarn that could look too busy. But I really like the way he's used a lot of those things. And I think if you buy two of his patterns, you get the third one free. So it's kind of a cool thing. And it uses one skein of Cascade Duo, which I don't think I have that. I have ordered some while doing Christmas shopping. I ordered one just so I could do this. And it's gonna be a caramel, or maybe caramel latte is the name of the one I got. So it's shades of brown. And it's a kind of a self-striping, but ombre like this, you can see the way it goes around. So it's not an even stripe and it's a little bit unpredictable and I just think it looks so neat. So it requires one Cascade Duo, which I also think Lion Brand Scarfy might be a similar, like if you want like just affordable yarn accessory, I think that might work similarly. And then a worsted weight. Although Scarfie's bulky, but you know, whatever. If this were bulky, I don't think I'd have a problem in the winter. And then you have a one solid color. And so he had a Cascade Aspen Heather. I would be using the natural mix. I, uh, 
I thought that would be a fun thing. I think that would be something I could work on in a theater. And also it's just a design I've looked at and wanted to make. There are several projects that he has that I like and to me they just say this is a stash buster project. This is perfect for stash busting. It is a wrap that looks kind of like a miter square uh, granny. I mean a miter square blanket wrap but it isn't just regular mitered squares. They have all sorts of patterning in them. Wouldn't that be a great stash buster? This is the picture probably from the knitting magazine. I think that looks like fun to do with stash leftovers. That was one and then Enderby is one that is a modular shawl you can make it wider if you wanted but it, it i mean it's a scarf but it could be a shawl or wrap you can make it wider you can make it into a blanket i think it's really cute that's a good use of scraps these are all similar stitch patterns but it's pieced together kind of puzzle like and it would be a great way to use coordinating stash leftovers and then the other one, and this one is pretty impressive to me because to me, this is a kind of cascade yarn that is hard to find a, a way to use. I don't actually have this yarn, but I, this could work with any yarn. But if he makes it work with this cascade yarn, I'm pretty impressed. It's the cascade jacket. It was made with 220 superwash paints, which I've used before. It made a, I used the least crazy variegated colorway, but it was still a pretty variegated sweater, which I do still wear. Um, but if you don't want busy, I don't know, something about this, it really worked. I'll show you his. That really looks cute to me. It doesn't look super busy. And it's got that mitered square look, but it's pieced together. There is a, pad, a project in here. They used Cascade Eco Duo and they used black and white. It calls, it looks like it took them like eight to nine skeins, skeins, but it's really cute because it's got that striping ombre effect. So I'm thinking self-striping yarn, ombre yarn, that Cascade jacket would be really cute. And it's just basically a cropped boxy shrug with a collar and you just fasten it closed. I, I think it's cute. I think it would be a fun use for stash busting, kind of like the granny square blankets are. I think it has that feel to it. So anyway, I just wanted to talk about his patterns because I, I, I don't know how I stumbled upon him, probably looking for uses for certain kinds of yarn, but he's pretty, he has got a pretty big like stockpile of patterns on Ravelry. I'll have links everywhere to all the stuff. I was wrong. I told you I thought Digital Lavender is what Pantone's color of the year was. They hadn't announced it yet. Um, like, do you remember back when designers would be talking about, ooh, the color of the year, what will it be? Um, it doesn't feel that way anymore. And I saw that Digital Lavender and I was like, Bleh. But that was just some group that forecast trends. That was just their guess. What Pantone chose was like, let me find it. I have it here for you. Vivid Magenta. Um, and the Times has the funniest little article on it. Oh, here's a photo they have to like kind of sell the, um, <laughs> the color. Gosh, it's bright. But does that not look like the Benjamin Moore, like magenta pink color on the wall and maybe Bear also? No, Bear was white uh, that I was showing you for colors of the year. So anyway, this article is so, to me, it's, it's a little short write up, but to me it was really funny because I don't know if AI have the last several years helped choose the color of the year, but they it was partially decided by ai what the color would be and just these different um writers talking about their thoughts on it it was so funny uh, some say it looks like TikTok's follow buttons and they just feel like it's all sort of a um, conspiracy of ai i'm gonna link this article it's not a big thing 
but um, it's like, like the shade itself, it seems to insist that we would be excited about it, but I'm coming up blank. So do you find that color polarizing and annoying? I am not a magenta, a bright pink person at all. That is not me. But I do have to say I have more yarn like that in my stash than the lavender. This looks a little light magenta, but it's way more toned down and it's more like that Sherwin-Williams Redent Point. This is Bouquet Heather by Knit Picks Wool of the Andy. Wool of the Andes. Wool of the Andy. And it's got a little brown and yellow in it. And I got this so long ago and I showed you and I said, I'm gonna make Meg by Junko Okamoto. And I haven't done it. Here is her Meg. She did it in a pink. It's so good. Now this was a one size fits all pattern though. That's the only thing. So it could end up being too small. You're just gonna have to work with your yarn you use and maybe add some, you know, you have to do modifications if you need it to be bigger, but this would be fun yarn for that. And I thought I ought to do that. Also, Wool of the Andes, these three colors, for Jennifer Beale's Badger sweater. Let me show you Badger. So like Meg is all cable delight. This is color work. Lots of fun striping with color work. Jennifer is such a master with piecing, making a fabric of color work look so pieced together and almost have a vintage quilty look to it. I just love it. So I chose my background color would be this cream and then these two colors, which are papaya heather and current for the rest of the sweater. <coughs> so you see, I got quite a accidentally magenta pantone look going here. So I don't know about you, but like AI choosing our color of the, first of all, anyone choosing <coughs> color trends, color of the year is funny to me. The last time I remember that being a big deal, it was purple one year, it was a big deal. And all the knitwear designers were putting out samples in purple. And then this color, um, burgundy, was big one year. And I remember that too. But uh, like that might yuck you out. And the idea of AI deciding it is like double yuck. Um, I'm mostly thinking stash accumulation and how to get rid of stuff, how to use stash. Okay, I gotta say this better. While I was making this episode, I realized I keep going back to stash busting, um, using little bits and minis, things like that kind of projects. I showed several in this episode. I actually didn't show all of them that I wanted to because of time. And I've been doing a lot of that lately because I think the thing I most need to focus on in the new year is stashing down. So I wondered if you guys would want to join me and this would be our knit along for the new year. It would be stash busting the new year. That would be the hashtag. And you can use old stash, new stash, a combo, just whatever to get the stuff out of your closets. I have a room that's only semi usable because of this in a closet that's jam-packed and that's really not good. So you can help me, I can help you, we'll encourage one another. The next episode I do, which will be very soon, I'm gonna show you quite a few stash busting patterns that I found that I'm very excited about. And I think this is the knit along I'm most excited about for the new year. So are you with me? If you are, I'll be putting it out on Instagram, but stash busting the new year, let's get rid of some of this junk. So that'll start after the beginning of the year, but until then, feel free to use the selfish Christmas knit hashtag with me because boundaries. <laughs>